And we're back. Uh, we were just having a conversation uh, yeah. uh, before the Tim Foundation. We were talking Foundation. Let's just dive right into it and share it with the listeners. Uh, your issues with Foundation second season, which I have not started yet. I've been slammed. I was on vacation, and you know the film week and all this stuff we're talking about today. So I have not had time to delve into Foundation second season. Does it improve on the sloggy mess that was the first season? I I, I believe well, it, retra- it, it, it retracts itself. It, it reconnects itself to the foundational material, if you if you will. Um, um, so we're walking through a story that's more familiar, particularly you know those of us who who read those you know yeah. books from way back in the day. Uh, that's more familiar, and you know we were just talking about it at all. The the the, 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 the principal problem that I that I really had with Foundation really just had to do with uh, just the kind of language that they use in the show because it's very present, it's very contemporary to the present moment and we were joking about yeah, it, it, a little bit look I want to hear a character say hey man you know or, or something like, yeah, I can't you know you can't you can't do that uh, and so I have a I have a, I have a problem with that but now that it's sort of pointed itself back at the story uh, the building of the the, the foundation the foundation I'm not gonna ruin it for anybody but you know the, the building of the second foundation is is, is where we are now and yeah. that's that's a, this is a story that I'm familiar with so I so I like it better um, um, uh, and but you know that that uh, that language thing is just a thing uh, that sort of drives you crazy the other thing that we we started talking about I was telling you uh, and you and you were telling me that you had to turn it off. I started listening to uh, listening to while watching shows that uh, that voice for the hearing impaired. I said, you know, and it started with turning on the uh, the subtitles or with everything. I just turn on the subtitles with everything now. You know, yep. uh, and, I, and I just have the subtitles on. I, I go, I do what I'm doing. I can read it from across the room. This mostly owes to the insanely inconsistent mixing of uh, programs, uh, broadcast television, every streaming service, DVDs. Uh, the mix of any given thing that you're watching is, is just outlandish. And you just have no idea what the gain will be on any given moment of broadcasting or or, or watching that you do. It's just terrible to my mind. It's just a- absolutely awful. Uh, even using um, some of the technology that we have to sort of level out, you know, the audio. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So I took to simply turning the audio down uh, and turning on subtitles. And now... I've taken to turning on that that automated voice, that uh, that that voice for the hearing impaired, and, and and you were telling me why you don't like it. I want you to make sure you tell everybody that. But I gotta tell you, it, 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 I enjoy it. I've been doing it not on television, but I've been doing it with, with, with articles, right? Like if I'm sitting in the car and there's an article and I, it's not a podcast or anything. So I want to, I'm like, I got to, I, I kind of want to hear that Substack. So, you know, cause I follow a lot of stuff on Substack. So I'll, I'll hit that little button at the top of the Substack mm. that, that reads it to you. And it's in this, I feel like it's a cross, like I'm a Stepford <laughs> person and Hal 9000 is reading me the news and it's very creepy. And I did it for like two days and I said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. This is just way too like, uh, it's way too AI. It's, it's, it is. It's it's wonky in the reading area. And it's, that's kind of strange too, because you know that that stuff has been around a while. Now that AI is taking is starting to do it, I think it's going to get better. Yeah. On uh, for listening to it while watching, you know, whatever it is that you're watching, streaming, whatever it is, it's 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 sort of interesting. Yes, you can still sort of hear that synthetic quality to it. Yeah. It does change from program to program. Um, you know, I'm watching Foundation. That's why we started talking about Foundation. There's this voice, you know. And then I switch over. I'm watching Shrinking, uh, which I think is Apple Plus. Yeah. And it's this other. It's like this v- weird little female voice that's doing the. <laughs> and, and it's just it's very very strange. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the voice is always a little bit ahead of the action. As I thought about it, um, I don't know. It, maybe it's just a timing thing uh, because I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, why would the voice? Is, this is meant for the visually impaired, obviously. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering why the voice would need to be ahead of the action. 
Great question. Uh, but I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing, but it's something that I've, that I've taken to doing. For one thing, it allows you to just get up and go do whatever the hell you want. And and, <laughs> and, 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 and until you know, you know, our car chase starts, you don't need to be there. I really do value that increasingly. Um, a little bit of news. So uh, our yeah. guest, Warren, Warren Pereira, who made the documentary Tiger 24, which oh, we yes. have covered on this podcast. We interviewed him on this podcast and we, we covered the movie on uh, on Film Week. We've kind of, you know, really given him the... Uh, the red carpet treatment uh tiger 24 is now on netflix yeah yeah so yeah anybody who hadn't caught up with it before you got your netflix subscription go watch it it's a great doc by a fantastic filmmaker who we we really really support and consider a good friend um let's yeah, talk uh obits here a little oh, bit because yeah. a whole got a whole bunch of them um yeah. I'll just lay them all out in one. Paul Rubens, Bo Goldman, and William Friedkin. That's yeah. the big gnarly trio that we lost. And Robbie Robertson, of course, you know, uh, as well. Not a yeah. film person, but, a, you know, a great musical talent who's been covered in movies like yeah, Indians the Last Rock. Waltz and, uh, and uh, Indians Who Rock. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, man, oh, man. I was, it was so weird. Uh, Paul Rubens. So, uh, for one thing, uh, you know, Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman, Paul Rubens. Um, when, when that was announced, it, you know, it caught me, caught, caught me by surprise, uh, the cancer. What yeah. surprised me most is that Paul was 70, a little bit, a little bit older, yeah. a little bit past 70. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of that Pee Wee persona, but Paul was always sort of in my head in that tiny little suit yeah. somewhere, somewhere around 38, 39, <laughs> you know, no matter what. See, as for me, um, for you, you he's in that little suit for me he's in that little adult theater in florida uh, <laughs> getting arrested that whole so, situation ah well yeah. you know we yeah a moment a moment paul had a moment <laughs> it, 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 look um one of the things i, I was a big I, I, a big fan of of uh, of paul rubens uh in his work and in, in his development of that character yeah. Pee Herman. i did not know uh that paul ruben had been on the gong show you know the gong show that yeah. you and i grew up on you using you in the middle 70s he's, Plus uh, sixty times, more than sixty times yeah. on the gong. I, and I watched the Gong Show, late seventies, whatever it is. Well, we didn't I don't think I, I don't think I ever knew. I just saw. You, I, I didn't, know, didn't know who he was. was. Time. Didn't know. I, I guess just, you know, I just had no it's idea. Like, again, it's like going back and, and revisiting the electric the electric company and going, oh, that's. That's Morgan Freeman. <laughs> What's he doing on the electric? I didn't know he was. Yeah, a nice soft yeah. shoe there he's got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, and, and it's like I mean, this happens to me all the time. Where I'll I'll go back and I'll revisit a movie. Like it, it happened to me after Mad Men had its run. I was watching, um, you know, as I do every Christmas season, I'll I'll watch uh, Love Actually. Uh, I love Love Actually, and then it gets to the end, and I go, oh. That's January Jones. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I, I, I she was nobody at the time. <laughs> ooh, ooh, and then, ooh, yeah, yeah, ooh, yeah. yeah. Not bad. It's a it's thing. A, just one of those things. Yeah. So anyway. It's a thing. But Paul, uh, but Paul. yeah, Paul, um I did see him, you know, a couple of times doing uh Nightmare Before Christmas live, recreating his original character in that. And uh, he did wonderful work for for Tim Burton. And um he left a he left a good solid legacy. You know, Pee Wee is Pee Wee's a hell of a character. Well, you know uh, that TV show. You, we were. Well, I, th we, I think you and I were chatting. Uh, you know, Pee, Pee, Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and, and everybody remembers Lawrence Fishburne, cowboy, whoever he was, Bob or whatever yeah. he was. You know, everybody remembers him. But I had forgotten that Jimmy Smiths came through that show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had forgotten that S and, 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 and Patha Murkison, uh you know, Law and Order, yeah. and all those you know homicides or whatever these yeah. big heavy dramas. You know, these uh, yeah. came through that show. I had forgotten all of those people came to that show and P re reached out and tapped all of those folks yeah. personally get me some Lawrence Fishburne get me some Jimmy Smiths yeah. uh, he, because he knew uh, that their their range was was much deeper and wider than than what we had suspected because he had seen them do all of these things before and you know Pee Wee's Big Adventure is is a is a very odd movie that lingers. I mean, it started Tim Burton's career. Mm. It took a TV character and gave it a a, a big screen persona, uh, a big screen profile in a way that that almost never happens. Mm. And uh, it's got some really priceless moments. I mean, the large march bulb is still one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen on screen. Mm. So uh, mm. yeah, mm. 
It's all there. Um, you know, Bo Goldman. Let's ah. talk about Bo Goldman for a second. One of the great writers of all time. No relation to William Goldman, but nah. a, a legendary screenwriter in his own right. Melvin and Howard, kind of the one that we always point to, but many other great screenplays as well. Oh, yeah. Um, one Flew with the Cuckoo's Nest. And yeah, I, One Flew with the Cuckoo's Nest. I, I, but, but, but I'm like you, though. I'm those little quiet... <laughs> He, he's one of those working screenwriters from from that early television age who when when drama was the thing right, right. realism right. was the thing right uh, so he's, he he wasn't writing uh, car chases he wasn't writing anything to do with aliens he wasn't writing this was all these were human stories and drama so you yeah. get movies like shoot the moon you know it was yeah. just about a marriage falling apart yeah, you know, it, which was you know weighty enough to have a, 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 a you know a full size film, and you get the Flamingo Kid, man. Uh, movies like that uh, that are just about you know people um, yeah. and dramatic scent of a woman, you know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that that kind of stuff. Well, uh, a great writer. If you're an aspiring writer, get hold of his screenplays and read the screenplays. Don't just watch the movies. Read the screenplays. Read how he wrote dialogue, how he constructed scenes. Get a get wrap your head around it. It's a it's a it's wonderful to to use him as a, as a benchmark. It really mm. is. Mm. Uh, man, Friedkin. What can we say? This guy came on uh, like a firestorm in the 1970s along with all the other 70s filmmakers you know we can we can throw in Coppola and Scorsese and Spielberg mm -hmm. and Lucas and you know De Palma and all of them who kind of came out of a maybe the late 60s a little bit but they really kind of defined the 70s but Friedkin did it in you know George Roy Hill probably another one but Friedkin mm -hmm. of that whole film brat generation is the guy who seems to be associated with the, the, the brattiest of it <laughs> you know um French Connection was just was was not your your grandparents cop movie. It was not the crime film that people had come to ex expect. Mm. It was in many respects it kind of has one foot in the black exploitation genre a little bit. It's sort of there across 100 and, you know, 10th uh, Street, yeah, yeah, 10th yeah. Street a little bit. Um but it but it's 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 gritty in a different way too. It's it you know it goes to to Europe and it it it's it's got, you know, something that is kind of hard to put your finger on. And The Exorcist was the same thing. It was not Rosemary's Baby. It was not, you know, uh, the previous generation of horror films. It was something new and creepy and really just, you know, it was all, I mean, you felt Friedkin's personality in these movies. You felt his anxieties. And what what can we say that, that defined him for that generation? Well, uh, look, um, I, I, I'm a film school guy. You're a film school guy. I love film schools. William Friedkin did not go to film school. <laughs> William Friedkin was a dude uh, who went to a war and, and, had, and he had jobs and he had life. And he, and he came up through documentary filmmaking, you know, yeah. uh, and had to learn all of the stuff he knew. How to, he knew how to string a nagara. He knew how to. He knew how to. He knew how to thread that 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 sixteen millimeter area. Uh, he knew all of that, and all of that you see that style, that verite you see in every film that you just yeah. mentioned, that French Connection. Uh, he, he didn't know how to make films, quote unquote, uh, in the way that you know Ford and all these people also didn't go to film school, by the way. But 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 all of these folks who were trained in the in in the traditions uh, of of the studio system, he didn't know how to do any of that, so he didn't try. <laughs> he didn't That's even a try. great point. And you know, I think I think the the movie, the most underrated film of his that oh. we, they have to revisit is To Live and Die in L.A. To Live and Die in L.A. Again, you know, you watch yeah. that movie, it's like you're watching a documentary, The Sorcerer. You know, which is you know, uh, uh, but you watch it, it the, the tension comes from the fact that you feel like you're involved in the thing because yeah. again, he brings the immediacy of that sense of verite. You know, um, and you know, and and, and, and I got to tell you, he didn't lose it. It's not like he lost it. The, the films changed. Yeah, but he never really changed. You know, no, he, he didn't. He, he was making real killer. Killer Joe is a nasty little. Is a nasty little number <laughs> 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 you know, that's only 10 years ago or so and uh that's a nasty little number that lives in the present day uh so there you go you know yeah yeah well let's jump into some movies i'm gonna blow through some uh we, we got a lot of great asian titles here have not done a segment on asian titles in a while so i want to blow through some stuff that's really great korean film project wolf hunting uh mm -hmm. these are all titles i'm gonna go through right now from uh, wellgo Project Wolf Hunting is basically uh, kind of a diehard on a ship, bunch of prisoners, jailbreak on a ship thing, uh, and they take over the ship. But, the, but it does this Korean thing because Koreans love to mix up genres. They love to, to turn one thing into another thing. 
And, um, and, 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 you know, with the, the last voyage of the Demeter tanking mm. right now, and yeah. mentioning this, mm. that also on this ship is, uh, it, I had to review this for film week too, is basically a zombie dude experiment, like a crazy Frankenstein-y guy down in the hold. And once he gets loose, it just, it's the whole, it, it's just roundabout mayhem. Mm. Doesn't really make sense. It's kind of a ridiculous movie on many, many levels, but. It, it, it's deeply entertaining. You're never bored. You roll your eyes a lot, but then it'll throw you a curveball, and you're never ever bored. Yeah. Um, the tank. Another. Uh, another. And gosh, these t- these titles. <laughs> uh, no, really, it's just. Uh, so the, the the the. I don't even know how to how to sum this one up. Um, the uh, this is you can it's it's in english first of all if that uh, assuages anybody it's uh it's it's english language um uh and i'm not entirely sure what the the uh the backstory is on this but the this is a about some people oh boy i'll, I'll give the whole thing away if i if i get too far into it. <laughs> um all right it's it is it is uh about um a family who inherits a certain property and um, there are family secrets associated with it. And those secrets emerge in deeply troubling and frustrating ways. Uh, so you know, it, it, it's a little bit like, um, Oh boy. It's it. I don't want to call it a haunted house story. It's a, it's a, cause it's a thriller. It's a thriller about mysteries. Mm. And it's called the tank and the tank is not a military tank. It's like a, it's like a, oh, a yeah. hidden tank, a, you know, tank. like a water tank, like a yeah. water tank. So, um, give it a look. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in the classic kind of Wellgo vein. About, 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 uh, 10, 10, 12 years ago, maybe less Scott, that's Scott Walker film. Uh, yeah. and, and Scott made this film, uh, with John Cusack and Nicholas Cage, when Nick, when you, you, you get Nick Cage and oh. John uh, you, 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 together, and I think it was called The Frozen or something like that, and it was yeah. loosely based on this true story set in Alaska. And it's just interesting the the, the, the the way these folks' careers go. That's about, about about ten years ago, which might be the last time uh, Scott knocked one of those things out. But he wrote it and adapted it. I got to Vanessa Huggins was in. I remember that she she was really young, and I got that was a really really good movie, The Frozen, and uh, but it was one of those ones that just kind of came and and went it was john cusack and nicholas cage funny the stuff that sticks in your head wow <laughs> just for that's no reason whatsoever totally uh we got a, we got a uh, an utterly bizarre korean film here called alienoid um again koreans love to mix up genres so i'm going to do my best to explain what this is so you got a couple of people from from a previous korean dynasty like a thousand years ago who uh, they're they're like you know shamanic shamanic uh, mystery men, and they magically or maybe not so magically transport themselves to uh, the future where they suddenly run into um, the problem of a people who are uh, like fighting a, a crazed alien that is basically like the alien, almost like the robot in the new lost in space. Oh yeah. So, um, it's, it's fighting aliens. It's time travel. It's people from a thousand years ago. It's people in the future. It's all of this stuff wrapped up in a story, which is beautifully, beautifully made. Oh yeah. But do not think about it for a single solitary no. second because the plot will unravel like a, like a moth eaten sweater. That's good. Look, I'm sorry. The, 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 the good looking movies they make. They make really good uh, looking movies. Full of a lot of good looking people, too. Yeah. Uh, I, I must say. And, you know, and some of that stuff. And, and they, they make these movies for a buck ninety five, but they look like they spent some bucks on them. Yep. It's for true. Uh, they, they get great production value out of this stuff. Absolutely top notch production value. Um, and then we have another Korean film called Night of the Assassin, which is just a straight up kind of. Um, it's you know it's it's a facsimile of a of a, like a, a feudal Japanese samurai film like a Ronin film lone samurai kind of thing except it's set in the same facsimile of Korean history so it's a period Korean uh, feudal action thriller um, 
you know, you, you get swordsmen and you get uh, oppressed villagers and all the usual stuff. Uh, it's ba- and it's basically a Ronin movie. It is. It's, yeah, it's yeah. basically a Kurosawa film, but it's but it's a lot of fun. It's really well done. Uh, Night of the Assassin, a final mission. And then a bunch of these on a new series of them. They're all Haya originals. These are all movies that you can see on Haya, which is the streaming platform for Asian uh, and martial arts uh, and action films. Uh, and these are all from that deal. So these are all Haya originals. Starts with Fist of the Condor, which is uh, pretty great. I thoroughly enjoy this. This is, um, you know, it's. I mean, it's 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 all martial arts. It's all all takes place um, in the in the wake of the um, the fall of the Inca Empire, 16th century, and uh, they just use that as a backdrop backdrop to invent a new martial art and they have a whole lot of fighting scenes. Uh, but it's pretty great, you know the um, the guy who stars in it, Marco Zoror, mm. whom you've seen in uh, the last John Wick film and a few others. Great fighter. So it's super cool that he gets his own thing. I think he's Hungarian or something like that. Yeah, big guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big, big, strong. Buff that chin dude. got one of those chins. Uh, got a young Ip Man movie here. As if we haven't had enough Ip Man movies, this has absolutely nothing to do with Ip Man's actual life story. This is just another one. This is trading on the title Ip Man. Throw it in, you know, throw that and some Wing Chun in there, and you're good to go. Probably one of the weaker uh, Ip Man movies, but uh, it's still got some decent fight stuff in it. You know, does again they they. You know, they, they get it has a number of scenes that, that justify it. Mm. Uh, the Grandmaster of Kung Fu is a, is a whole lot of fun. Um, this is a mainland Chinese film, but it has that uh, that Hong Kong style before it. And of course, they have to tie it in with Ip Man here. They the the tagline on the back is before Ip Man. <laughs> Before Ip Man, now we're before we've 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 exhausted Ip Man's life, right? But we have, now we're going before Ip Man. There was Master Huo. All right, doesn't okay. have quite the same same ring to it, but uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, as with a lot of Chinese films, a lot of anti Japanese sentiment here, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the you know they 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 the Japanese are the bad people here. It's yeah, going to be that know, way for a while. The non king thing, man. What are you yeah, do? it's it, it's what it is. Anyway, uh, so yeah, you're you know it's Qing Dynasty fighting the fighting the Japanese and uh, lots of great martial arts stuff. Uh, we also have the legend of Gatat Kaka, and I, I don't want to emphasize the Kaka. I'm sorry, but that's what this is called. The legend of Gato Gatat Kaka, G-A-T-O-T-K-A-C-A, a hero awakens. Um, you know, it's it's a martial arts thing. It's a superhero thing. It's a little bit of Doctor Strange. Um, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of the mystical martial arts stuff that we've seen before. Um, there's an English language track in here, which you might want to take advantage of because otherwise none of this stuff will make sense. (laughs) But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's got its moments. It's got its moments. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're doing superhero stuff a little bit differently elsewhere in the world. Mm. And then the last one here from the well go well is a uh, code of the assassins. So this is uh, this is another medieval sword play thing, but it's more of the uh, the epic war. It's not in the samurai vein. It's in the vein of those uh, period Chinese films, which are all about f- battling warlords and armies. And uh, they're oftentimes Mongols. And um, yeah, this, and this one, you know, it's about a about a young assassin who is caught in the middle of all of this, uh, this intrigue and these, these palatial plots. And uh, again, you know, it, it gets a little convoluted. It, all of the, the various uh, interlocking, interacting parties and their, their, uh, their cross purposes, but um, it's very well done. Production value is through the roof. And mm. you wonder why can't all Hollywood films have that kind of consistent, uh, that kind of consistent production value. Um, also the, uh, got some DVDs here from film movement, two of them also, ha- um, from, uh, Korea. Uh, one is a horror film called C- Sire, S E I R E from Park Kang. This played at the Fantasia film festival. Um, it is like all Korean horror, uh, really, really chilling. It's a, it's a ghost story. And uh, it gave me absolutely the willies. Uh, very, very effective mood. Not on Blu-ray, only on DVD. And then another lovely film called Aloners. 
And this, uh, this is a drama and it's a really, really lovely Korean film. Uh, it comes with a great short film on it too called The Moths Will Eat Them Up. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, this is, uh, this is a, a, a f- this is kind of a, it's a it's a it's a it's a, a workplace movie which is usually a French thing, and we got another one of those that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Movies about jobs and the workplace, nah, the stresses yeah. of employment. That's not really a Hollywood thing. We don't make those kinds of movies not anymore. Mar- uh, you got to go back to oh, blue I collar. guess uh, um, a blue collar, maybe sadly filled with Martin Ritt. Yeah, uh, exactly. Martin Ritt might have did exactly. Stanley and Iris, yeah. uh, something like that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, not uh, not just uh, not for fifty years, Judge. 30, 40 so, years, yeah. So that's that's partly what this is. This woman, she works at a call center. You know, she does. Uh, she just lives on a lives on the on the phone all day long, and um, she now has to train a new employee. And it's about friendship. It's about work. It's about all of these things that are kind of a, a microcosm of issues in Korean society. Mm. So really, really, and you know how people do feel alone and they feel isolated uh, because of the modern world. So aloners. It's a nice little film. And uh, and then we've got a a Thai movie called Cracked, uh, which is Thai horror. It's a ghost story. Uh, Thai movies freak me out a little bit too. Uh, <laughs> they do because because they, they always go to some like some weird village witchcraft thing. You know, there's always something about somebody who lives in a little uh, a little hut somewhere in the mountains <laughs> in the rain, and they've got a pot and they put weird like <laughs> bat, yeah. put bats in the pot, and then ghosts come alive and start eating people. <laughs> so there's all kinds of weird stuff going on with ancient stuff. Anyway, this has some this has some shots, and I'm going to say some scenes. This has some shots that will just make you scream absolutely scream very very effective uh so anyway the uh, it's called cracked and uh don't watch it with your family just telling you that um getting down here oh let me let me uh i'm gonna put a couple of the the rest of the japanese stuff on hold let me just go through the uh, the hong kong stuff real fast because okay. it's, it's it's really great so um from arrow Got a couple of great, a lot of great stuff from Arrow, but first a couple of standalones. Hand of Death is an all-time classic. Uh, comes with Mandarin and English lossless on it, plus uh, Cantonese stereo. Um, this is a 1976 Golden Harvest release, and uh, it uh, it was not like a huge success at the time. It's a kind of a Shaolin Temple story, but man, it does have some great fighting in it. Really great stuff. Uh, same thing for Warriors 2, which which features oh, Casanova yeah. Wong and Sammo Hung. Anything with Sammo is worth watching. Uh, this is also a um, and this yeah. was um, this was Sammo Hung's directing debut, by the way. So yeah. it uh, you know, you, you see it's a great director in his own right. Better than Jackie Chan in many respects, I think. Mm. And then some great box sets. Uh, the Brave Archer collection. These are wonderful, wonderful movies. There are um, five of them on here. Uh, the Brave Archer, the Brave Archer 2, Brave Archer 3, the Brave Archer and his mate, and Little Dragon Maiden. Uh, these are absolutely terrific uh, wuxia stories. It's a wonderful saga. All the stories are, are, are great. All five films are, are top-notch. Uh, they've got a feature-length documentary on here as well, and audio commentaries, and it's all great stuff. It's a wonderful education in this film series, but in the wuxia genre in particular. I love the box covers for every single one of those. It's just oh, great. beautiful graphic designs, so much energy and action. And Academy Award winner Michelle Yeoh anchors the In the Line of Duty films, all four of them. Comes with a booklet as well. This is this is from um, uh, Fortune, the Fortune Star collection, and uh, it is. This is just an absolutely wonderful collection of films. You got to check these out if you can. Uh, if you can uh, find them, I think this is increasing. This is from eighty eight, uh, the eighty eight films uh, library via Fortune Star. Anyway, the In the Line of Duty films are terrific. Cynthia Rothrock's in the, in here as well. You know, anything with with uh, with Cynthia Cynthia and Michelle is mm. absolutely to die for. It's fantastic. One of my all-time favorites, Zoo Warriors from the Magic Mountain. Uh, this was directed by Choi Hawk. There's been another Zoo Warriors since, which he was also involved in. The original, there's nothing like it. Absolutely fantastic. This is from Shout Factory. And uh, it's one of the all-time great uh, Hong Kong New Wave era uh, wuxia films. Yun Bu, one of the uh, one of the three brothers with Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung, is uh, is the star. He's an mm-hmm. he's a deserter, and there's you know ancient vampires in the mountains, and it's it's just it's it's a riot. It's absolutely a lot of fun. The fighting, the comedy, the whole thing is fantastic. 
Uh, Donnie Yen, a very young Donnie Yen, is uh, all these people are in hot hot movies now. Donnie Yen, of course, the blind guy in the <laughs> yeah. last John Wick. Yeah. Uh, one of his earlier films is Tiger Cage. Um, which has been bootlegged forever because nobody would put it out on Blu-ray. Shout Factory finally did. And they include the sequels as well, Tiger Cage 2 and 3, which are not as good, mm. but it doesn't matter. There's their bonuses on here. Uh, Tiger, this is directed by Yun Wu Ping, of course, you know, legendary of uh, early Jackie Chan and all mm-hmm. the way to the Matrix. Uh, Tiger Cage is great, great action stuff. And it's kind of the movie that made Donnie Yen a superstar. Yep. Donnie Yen also made Iron Monkey along with Yurong Guang, which is the story of a kind of a lone rangery Zoroi type hero played by Yurong Guang, uh, who wears a mask. And Donnie Yen is this dad who, you know, winds up allying himself with him. Tiger Cage had a good run here in a hacked up version from Miramax and Harvey Weinstein. I actually interviewed uh, Donnie for the first time at my house for mm. that and got a piece in the L.A. Times. So I was the first person to interview Donnie Yen for a major American newspaper. Mm-hmm. Thank you for this yes, movie. Yes, yes. But it's a great movie. It is a great movie. Iron Monkey, awful lot of fun. Donnie Yen is terrific. Just the uh, one, not the uh, not 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 the set. Iron Monkey two. Just no, the no, one. no, no, no. Just Iron Monkey one. That's it. Okay. No, no other Iron Monkeys. The, mm-hmm. And it's really the only one you need to see. Mm-hmm. Donnie Yen also stars in uh, Sakura, which is uh, a little bit of an offbeat thing for him. But it's it's also, you know, Wuxia. It's based on a, on a novel that I'm not familiar with. Uh, you know, it was never released here in English. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, he's a, he's like a gritty uh, martial arts master. And he's uh, he's been accused of murder. And, you know, he's got a he's. He, he has to come out of exile and clear his name. And, uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a familiar, a familiar trope, but it's still great. Mm. Um, Jet Lee, the legend of Fong sai one and two, a double feature, um, that is absolutely to die for. This is wonderful. These movies have not been properly released until now on Blu-ray and get them both. They're absolutely a joy. I remember seeing these at um, at a Hong Kong film festival right when they were initially released in the early 90s. They defined Jet Li. He had only done the the Shaolin Temple movies of, of significance before this, and these just put him over the top. These movies are hilarious, brilliant, funny, uh, eccentric, beautifully shot. Uh, you you just can't can't do better. Heart of Dragon, Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung together. Uh, this is like if uh, so if some if if you had done Rain Man as a martial arts film, <laughs> that's what this is. Uh, Sammo plays a uh, a mentally handicapped guy. Jackie is his brother, and uh, they have an awful lot of fun over the course of this movie. Don't think too much about the uh, the plot. It's really really fun. And then more Jackie Chan's in two volumes. Uh, the Jackie Chan collection, both of these from Shout Select. Um, this is essential for anybody who wants uh, to be a Jackie Chan completist. There's just an unbelievable amount of good stuff on here, but you got to kind of know the films a little bit. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, there's audio commentaries galore, back stuff, backdrops on, on Jackie's career and, you know, a lot of great stuff. Armor of God and Armor of God 2, Operation Condor are both here. Absolutely essential. Uh, crime Story and City Hunter, super mm. fun. Um, the crime Story is very serious. City Hunter is based on the video game. It's a little bit wacky. Um, you know, I'm always amused at this, by the way, City Hunter. Here's a little detour on City Hunter. So what's his face? Uh, Norton. I forget to get his first name. Uh, Chuck? The bad guy. Oh, Richard Norton. Richard Norton. Thank yeah. you. So Richard yeah. Norton plays the bad guy here. And and City Hunter is basically diehard on a, on a cruise ship. And, you know, you get some you get some things that are not PC, like Jackie looks at a woman's chest. And then and, and there's like this little <laughs> these hamburgers, like these hamburgers appear where her breasts are. And he reaches out because he's hungry. Uh, it's dumb, wacky, campy humor like that. We'll never uh, fly today. Uh, there's a musical interlude like a you know like a, a teen boy band performs it's all very very odd movie um uh for reasons that you would understand if you're a hong kong fan the the, uh, the, the director of city hunter is a bit of a legendary figure yeah. but anyway um but here's the thing richard norton this is a white guy in hong kong who clearly understands his job is to play the bad guy in yeah. every single movie there are no legit acting opportunities for him and you know he's good with that yeah, he's, yeah, he just plays out. Hey, and kept him going, kept him going through a whole bunch of movies. That's it. 
so the killer meteors is on uh one of these volumes as well shaolin wooden men uh there's just a lot of stuff here uh, uh dragon fist uh, so, you know, winners and winners and uh, sinners is an awful lot of fun. The protector in its original cut, not the American cut, the original Hong Kong cut. So, I mean, there's it, it, this is, you know, twinkle, twinkle, lucky stars. These are great sets. You just you got to get these. These films are great transfers. Many of them have never been transferred here, uh, have been shown here in proper form. So it's essential. Mm. And then lastly, a ton of Shaw Brothers stuff. So. This is courtesy. Shaw Brothers will not keep their library together. So you got to piecemeal this stuff together a little yeah. bit. So um, we have uh, Shaw Brothers Classics, uh, Volume 1 and 2 from Shout. Uh, and there's a ton of amazing stuff here. Uh, the Assassin is top notch. Brothers 5 is legendary. Uh, there's like 12, or 11 or 12 movies on each of these things. The Flying Guillotine is here, which I absolutely adore. Uh, the Master of the Flying Guillotine, not here. Mm. I've, done, I've done two audio commentaries for yeah. that. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so, but The Flying Guillotine is the sequel, and it's fine. Not as good as the original, but it's fine. That's here, and that's nice. Uh, Man of Iron, uh, The Bells of Death, The Flying Dagger, which wants to be a Flying Guillotine. Yeah, and all, of this, all this stuff is really, really great. That's on the Shout Factory sets. And then we have volume two of the Shaw Scope uh, 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 set series from Arrow, which is that's the top tier stuff. That's the really, really uh, hot stuff. This thing has is amazing. This is a big, beautiful box set like the previous volume is. And this includes uh, double features on every single one of these discs. There are eight discs and uh, the movies are My Young Auntie, uh, Magnificent Ruffians, Ten Tigers of Kwantung. Um, 36th Chamber of Shaolin, Legendary Disciples of the 36th Chamber, Return to the 36th Chamber, Mad Monkey Kung Fu, uh, The Kid with the Golden Arm. All these things are legendary films. You can't go wrong with any of this stuff. So if you're a Shaw Brothers fan, you will love all of this. All right. And let me just pull out a couple of, hold on here. A couple of Japanese titles here. Uh, Hideo Gosha made a lot of great samurai movies and uh, gangster movies. He, We've got Samurai Wolf 1 and 2. Uh, if you're a Gosha fan, those are really, really good. Uh, also great from the gangster end of things are is Violent Streets. So these are all from uh, Film Movement. And then we've got Ultraman versus Red King. And Ultraman, uh, this is like a... This is this is from Mill Creek. This is a uh, part of their Ultraman Battle Kaiju series, and this is the first volume. So there's going to be a lot of these. Um, Ultraman versus Red King is basically Ultraman versus a really really bad Godzilla suit. Mm. <laughs> that's all I can. That, that's what it appears to be to me. Um, I'm not a big fan of the, the the Ultraman movies from that period, so I couldn't tell you. Uh, a more serious recent movie is Ultraman Shin or Shin Ultraman. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the visual effects are basically still just as cheesy, but uh, it's got a little bit more of a modern sheen on it. And it's, uh, you know, you'll recognize some of the actors in here. Like, for example, uh, Kimio Tamura, who was in Drive My Car. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sorry. The, well, the, that's the character. Yeah. The, act, the, the, uh, the actress is um, Hidehoshi Nishimura. I guess. Oh my so gosh. Anyway, anyway, it's the actress from drive my car. Yeah. Who, who stars in it. So you'll recognize her and, uh, warm water under a red bridge. Tim, did you ever see this? I don't think I did. Okay. So Shohei Imamura, who has won two palm doors at the Cannes film festival made this, uh, what year was this? I can't even remember what year it was. This is like 20 years ago. Yes. Yeah, 2001. So, uh, he, I saw this and I reviewed this for box office at the time. Um, this is a weird, surreal, wonderful fable. It's magical, hmm. but it's a totally, totally creepy movie. And, uh, the, it, it, it connects. It's mystical. It is clearly symbolic. I don't know that it's based on anything ancient, but it all takes place in a small village and it, without giving anything away, a there's um there's a woman who uh 
her reproductive system is connected in some respects to the stream in the village. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how or why it still doesn't make sense to me, but when it, it is poetic the way that it is all executed in a very creepy and weird way, but it's a, it is a very unique film. Um, and then uh, Japanese filmmaker Naomi Kawase, a couple of films from her, Still the Water and Radiance, mm. both of which are very, very beautiful and poignant and poetic. Wonderful filmmaker. Those are, if you're a fan of Kawase, these are worth checking out. Mm -hmm. um, again, the films are Radiance and Still the Water from Film Movement. Uh, an anime film turned live action called Whisper of the Heart. Totally bizarre. I don't get it at all. Uh, it's It's got some sweet acting and, and a cat. And uh, otherwise, I, I've never seen the anime. I don't think I want to after seeing that. Uh, Cora Ada, <laughs> a beautiful, wonderful filmmaker of Shoplifters, which was Oscar nominated. Miyazaki is one of the writers of that. I was just noticing the, that Whispers of the Heart movie. He, he's not a director, but he's one of no, the No, he was one of the writers of the original yeah. anime. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I, it, this thing's. It's, I don't know what he, I don't know it either, but uh, yeah. It's a little bit, little bit odd, but mm. it is what it is. And then uh, the Cora Ada film Broker, which is lovely, absolutely yeah. lovely. Um, kind of continues uh, some of the themes that he started in Shoplifters and uh, Song Kang Ho, the uh, the great Korean actor, is the star. And it's uh, it's really beautiful. This never got a great release because of the um, pandemic, but it's yeah. worth rediscovering right now. Broker. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. One of the ones I talked about on film week. Very good. It, it's good, right? It yeah. is. It's really good. And then uh, and then the last two are, um, you know, basically uh, Japanese gangster movies. Yakuza Graveyard finally gets its uh, its uh, Blu-ray premiere. Hasn't been out before. Uh, Kenji Fukasaku, the great uh, gangster film director from Japan. This is an an epic film. You know, Yakuza Graveyard. Just trust me, it's amazing. And then the uh, Game Trilogy, which is includes the movies The Most Dangerous Game, The Killing Game, The Execution Game, uh, all starring Yusaku Matsuda, and it's just good. Solid 1970s, late 1970s era, you know, gangster crime stuff. Great era for Japanese cinema. Uh, movies are tough, not too, not overly uh, graphic, and uh, you'll have a lot of fun. Really, really well written, but they're straight up kind of noir genre films and beautifully, beautifully shot. Uh, and uh, that's it for the, the great Asian titles. Mm. So let's talk about uh, new stuff, television, 4K. You tell me. You know, uh, you just uh, real quick, if you don't mind popping over to the Arrow, just because there are a couple of movies yeah. in there, Last Starfighter, oh, yeah. Mall, Rest of World, World uh, um, you know, from uh, the 80s and 90s, the early days that I, that I, that I really, really dig, particularly um, Last Starfighter, Nick Castle's film. Uh, which I happened to, there was this wonderful documentary series called In Search for Tomorrow, In Search for Tomorrow. Yep. And you remember that thing I did with um, uh, oh, all, all those sci-fi movies from the 80s. Yeah. And, and uh, Last Starfighter was one of them. And, and Lance Guest was one of, the, one, of the, one of the folks on the panel that I was on there. It was really lovely to talk to him. And we had a really wonderful <laughs> chat about that movie uh and uh, and how it really was uh you know at that at the precipice at the, at the beginning of that era of films this is like 1984 and then, and the um the um the technology the cgi is not quite y there yet but i remember seeing this movie you know, okay, Catherine, Mary Stewart, and, and Lance Guest, and all the, you know, all the Daniel Harrell, and, and and really, really thoroughly enjoying it, and thought and thinking it was a whole lot of fun. This what this movie has been talked about for a remake for a while, and yeah. I'm not sure you could capture the magic of it because. It was it was a moment when video games were innocent. Like video games now are so sophisticated that we expect everything to be kind of like Ender's Game isn't even realistic yeah. now. Like everyone expects like, oh, yeah, I could totally defeat an alien empire because I've been playing <laughs> you know, whatever game and people will take it seriously. And the idea of a, of a kid who goes to the arcade and is good enough at a video game that that qualifies him to, you know, engage in intergalactic battle. That was amazingly sweet and innocent on an E.T. level kind of wish fulfillment thing in the 80s. Yeah, it really exactly. was. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. A lot of fun. Anyway, so that was one of the ones there that I really, really sort of dug from way back then. And then Mall Rats. Look, uh, let's see what you want about Kevin Smith. Every now and again, <laughs> every now and again, he got one right. This is one that I thought that he got right. I think that this film really does capture the zeitgeist of a moment, 1990, whatever the heck it was, yeah. two, three, four, five, you, uh, with, with uh, Shannon Doherty and Jason Lee and Jeremy Lund and all of these sort of folks from that period, including those characters that, that Kevin and, um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, whoever, whoever that knuckle is. And but then through the film, you, who you got? You got Ben Affleck walking around before he became Batman and everything else. Jason Mewes, that's the guy. Yeah. And you still got you still you still got Stanley. He shows up in one of those solid Stanley moments, you know, that he does. And just all that cast of characters. I had forgotten that. that. Oh, yeah. He's in there. He's in there. I had forgotten that. That whole, that whole, that whole thing. So, so anyway, this was one that uh, malls and malls are gone. There are no more malls. So one day in the future, the title of this film won't even make any sense to some people. That's so true. That's so true. Uh, Waterworld, same year, 95. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Costner's big, gigantic movie, such a huge movie, so much anticipated for this film that they built an entire uh, the theme uh, presentation at Universal Studios here uh, uh, you know, for the film, which, 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 you know, long after the film flopped at the box office, that, <laughs> that, that Waterworld world, uh, theme, it's not a ride, it's like a presentation thing, yeah. uh, which I attended many times, was still there uh and I, and I have to tell you water world is a film that you know it it, it took it, it, it it took a good kick uh kevin Riddle's directing yeah it was, they, they were saying road warrior on water uh, yeah and all that kind that of stuff. I, I, I remember thoroughly enjoying this film at the time and in the many years since having you know when it pops up here it pops up there it gets me down. It gets me to sit down and 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 watch it for a little while. It's a it's a very energetic film. You know, it's a lot of fun. And Dennis Hopper is just having a damn good time in this. He movie. really is. He really is. And it's worth noting: Waterworld, Mallrats, and The Last Starfighter all on 4K. These are their 4K debuts mm. from Arrow. Uh, one other one from Arrow, not a 4K. It's only Blu-ray. But uh, make quick mention of the Assassination Bureau, which is mm. a super fun film that has been yes. out a few times, but. Never Never with all these, uh, the the some of the with the, never looking as good as this, and with some of the extras that this has. It has a new audio commentary with Sean Hogan and Kim Newman, uh, and a thirty minute appreciation by uh, broadcaster and historian Matthew Sweet, which kind of puts this thing in its context. For those who don't know, this is a I, I don't want to call it a superhero movie. It's kind of like a Mission Impossible y sort of thing that is set in nineteen oh eight, just before World War One, based on a novel that Jack London never finished. Mm-hmm. And it was published after he died. Um, but it's it's really, really uh it's it's it 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 has a really fun vibe to it. Diana Rigg oh, yeah. and and Oliver Reed and Telly Savalas, all people who have, you know, a certain a certain genre identification for us. And um uh you know, it's great. Uh, Diana Rigg plays a very early kind of suffrage um yeah. activist and um and she, you know, discovers this uh this secret group called the assassination bureau. And, uh, they have, they've been around a long time and all the, all the pieces start falling into place. And it's really quite fun. Oliver Reed is, uh, really has a lot of fun with this. He, uh, it's one of his most enjoyable parts. So, um, yeah, uh, assassination bureau. Diana, Diana Rigg, Any, uh, any, anything with young Diana Rigg, forget about uh, it. Any Diana uh, Rigg, any Diana Rigg. Yeah. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we can do criterion. Uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, cr- criterion. If you don't mind, because there are a few, sure. there are a few there. Uh, I, I was doing after hours, for instance, is at the top of that list. And criterion um, um, after hours, uh, Martin Scorsese's film, and I was, I was, I was talking about something, and this movie came up. Oh, I know what it was. It was Bo, Bo is afraid. Um, uh, the area asked, yeah. uh, which we're also talking about. So, want to talk about that in the same? It, I guess we, we squeeze them all together because yeah. the one thing is, I'm not look. Um, they're not nuts about a lot of Ari Aster, but certainly, certainly Bo is Afraid is an interesting film. It's really, really long. But when I got to thinking about it, I could tell that it was drawing a lot from, at a minimum, After Hours, if not some other sort of films from the period that had that sort of sense of a roaming Inter uh, psychological uh, character yeah. just roaming around, and I, there's a lot there. That, that this to me is a lot more fun than Bo is Afraid, which is you know uh, has yeah. more in common probably with oh I don't know um, uh, um, the guy that, the guy that wrote adaptation um, um, oh uh, Kaufman, Charlie, Kaufman, Charlie Charlie Kaufman. Kaufman yeah a lot of that kind of you know, the all that kind of stuff there. But anyway, this movie I remember liking a whole whole lot, and it's kind of off the beaten path. For uh, young Martin yeah. Scorsese. 
Well, uh, After Hours is, is also a 4K debut. Tons of extras on here, including a commentary with Scorsese and uh, Thomas Schoonmacher and um, another commentary with Scorsese. And, well, yeah, Scorsese and Schoonmacher uh, and um, uh, Michael Ballhouse. Mm. And uh, Griffin Dunn is in on it as well. I have not had a chance to listen to that yet, but I will. That would be neat. That would be neat. Yeah, got to be neat. Bo is Afraid, well, as long as we're on the subject, uh, yeah. that's also out. It uh, comes with the, from Lionsgate, gets a digital copy on it. I have not watched this. I know you You watched some of it. Yeah, yeah, a good chunk of it. Uh, uh, it's three it's, hours it's, long. It's three hours long. Yeah. You know, and look, as, as I say often about Ari, uh, uh, he makes films that are uh, interesting, uh, <laughs> that I find interesting, but he's he's yet to make a film that I actually like. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, Midsommar and, and uh, Hereditary. Yeah. And, they, and, and, you know, and, they're, and they're and they're very, you know, internal and all of this, and I appreciate the filmmaking, but, you know, I don't actually like any of these movies. And this is another one, uh, um, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, Bo, um, and it's, yeah. it's, just, it's it's look, it's a film about a guy and his relationship with his mother is an extremely unhealthy relationship with his mother and, and how that manifests itself inside his 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 psyche, his internal psyche, his external existence. It's divided into these sort of like large chapters that we sort of work our way through, but that's at the end of the day, what's going on every place, whether it's inside his mind or in the real world, there is his mother lurking over him and his guilt and in all kinds of things. I will say this, Joaquin, again, in a very, very committed performance um, um, uh, of a movie that I appreciate, but don't actually like using the word committed very loosely. Yeah. Um, so other 4Ks from Criterion here. Uh, let's kind of uh, pick oh, and choose. And breathless. I see that one. Breathless. Yeah. yeah. Godard is breathless on 4K, a movie that was not even shot on 4K. It was shot on 16 millimeter with uh, a lot of grit. Um, I can tell you this. I don't know that that movie needs to be in 4K because there isn't 4K worth of data on that original 16 millimeter <laughs> film. Yeah. But... Uh, I am grateful for what they did because it, it, the, it certainly does feel richer and more kind of in the moment, all, especially all the scenes where you see everybody on the streets of Paris looking, looking into the camera and thinking, Who, what are these people doing? Mm. I mean, this is guerrilla filmmaking, uh, you know, 101. Yeah, talk uh, about uh, uh, freaking, uh, you know, none of, yeah. these guys, none of these guys went to film school either. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that 4K... Um, I, what I noticed is that it renders things that were were never really black, you know, black and white. We say black yeah. and white, uh, but there was never anything in that film that was actually black or white. Yeah. No. <laughs> it, was, it was not really in the 4K. There are things that are black and there are things that are white. There, there's a silhouette of, yeah. uh, of uh, 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 when Gene Seberg is is is, is walking uh, through a through a, through a uh, an alcove toward the yeah. light. And, and and she and she and he, but mostly she is carved out in black and white. That was never that crisp before. Yeah. Um, um, so you know, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of interesting, and I don't know that it's correct, but it's it, it, when they're running down the streets, black and white, black and white at night. Yeah. Uh, the, the lights of the cars, it's black and it's white, which is you know that's that's interesting. Also on 4K and very a, str- a very strange choice for Criterion to go 4K on this. So I, I I will I will let Tim weigh in on why he thinks they did this. I have no idea. The renowned westerns by Bud Boddicker with Randolph Scott. That's renowned R A N O W N. And the mm. films. This is five films in a box set. Uh, the Tall T Decision at Sundown. Buchanan Rides Alone. Ride Lonesome and Comanche Station. I am not a fan of any of these. I'm not really a fan of Randolph Scott generally, but I get he had a moment where these films were, you know, this is, these are all kind of late 50s, early 60s, 57 to 60s when the films were made. Yeah, some, um, of, that, some of that foundational material, which I know more, I, I, the tall T, I think it's Elmore Leonard. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, yeah, Elmore. Um, so I don't know, uh, the, the sort of foundational material in some of that stuff, because Elmore was basically doing noir 
So the tall yeah. tea, that's, that would be that, that an example of how noir can be in any genre. <laughs> yeah. because that's a noir um, uh, uh, and so you know I, I, but there you go um, uh, yeah uh, it, why on 4K though like, why, why would we put those five films in yeah, 4K yeah, 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 there's, there's look there's a lot of saturation in some of them but I don't know I, I, it's a good question it's a good yeah. question you crank yeah. up to the Vinci and, but it's not like it's tech, these, it's not like these were these were ever technicolor or anything like that no yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we also have Thelma and Louise in 4K. Um, you know, Ridley Scott kind of uh, stopped doing genre stuff and became a real filmmaker in the eyes of a lot of people with this movie. They thought, wow, it doesn't have aliens or it's not futuristic. It's not, you know, kind of action-y. It doesn't have that genre-y thing that he's being associated with because he had done prior to this pretty much it was, you know, the duelists. Which was, you know, dual, midi, kind of a still an action sort of thing. Alien and Blade Runner and Legend. And, you know, suddenly he's he's doing something that is just a legit drama. Boom. Yeah, Real yeah. filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. A lot Kelly of great Kelly extras. Script, yeah. Um, documentary in here that features everybody. And, um, mm. you know, does this film hold up, Tim? Does it hold up for you? Well, actually, it does. You know, this is really one of my one of my favorite films of 90, 91, 91. I guess it's 91. Um, uh, yeah, it's 30 years old. It, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're there, Cali Corey there and uh, you know, yeah, Gina and Harvey. And interesting that for for, for really Scott, you know, you, you think of Ridley Scott and, and, and what Ridley Scott turned out to be was a woman's director. Yeah. Um, um, you know, um, obviously Ripley, uh, you know, um, uh, Sigourney Weaver uh, and, and, and this film here and a few others. It, it's, you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought that about Ridley. But when it comes to Ridley, uh, that's what that's what he turned out to be. A woman's director. Even that film that he made with um, uh, the one with Adam Driver. And uh, oh, yeah. uh, uh, it's really, uh, you know, that's really that's really her film. So um, does this hold up in a certain sort of way? Culturally, does it hold up? That's really the question, right? Because yeah. culturally, over the years, this film has taken a beat down. And then it yeah. kind of had a cultural comeback uh, um, uh, in, in the sort of the post Me Too sort of movement. So it's an interesting sort of thing. I always was feeling it uh, way back in 91. Uh, but, it's, but it's interesting to see how the culture uh, sort of puts a film through the ringers uh, over the, in, in, in some ways. Akira Kurosawa's Dreams in 4K is a wonderful thing. This is 4K and Blu-ray combo, and it is a wonderful thing. I first saw this film projected. It was shot in HD. It looked ugly. It didn't look the way it needed to look because it was HD and they transferred it to film and all the technology was a little bit wrong. It's been very beautifully cleaned up. Wonder if all the colors are vibrant like they like they were not at the time in 1990. Mm. And, um, you know, what a lot of people remember most about this is uh, Martin Scorsese playing Vincent Van Gogh and yeah. disappearing into his own paintings. And mm. you're like, wow, Martin Scorsese directed by Kurosawa. That's a who knew. Um, there's a great audio commentary on here by Stephen Prince. Really, really beautiful. It contextualizes everything perfectly. And then uh, a, a documentary by Catherine Kadu, who, who's, you know, been was a longtime translator for um, Akira Kurosawa. Mm. Great interviews here. Bertolucci is interviewed in Yuritu, Hayama Miyazaki and Scorsese. Really, really good stuff. So a lot of great mm. extras on here. I'm still waiting for a big old Kurosawa box set. But in the meantime, 4K for Dreams, which is, you know, a series yeah. of vignettes based on his actual dreams like Kurosawa made yeah. mo these little short films about his dreams. It's, 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 it's interesting. It, 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 Yoshiro Honda, uh, not usually credited with some of the writing that he did on yeah. some of those sequences there, which is always, always sort of interesting uh, uh, there, but yes, his dreams, his dreams. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, 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 I hope they correct that in that box set and they talk yeah. about a little bit about, Yoshiro Honda's connection to I, I don't know, but I will absolutely check. Yeah. Uh, and the last of the 4K criterions is One False Move, Carl Franklin's oh, One False yeah, Move, man. which introduced the world to Cinda Williams and Billy Bob Thornton and Bill Paxton was kind of came of age. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Cinda Williams was in uh, the the uh, the last call, the little that little bar film that my friends shot at Lacey, Lacey Street, where I was wrangling extras. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, got to meet right. Cinda Williams there. She was the femme fatale in that film. Uh, you know, One False Move is is a seminal movie, and yet 
It's kind of forgotten. Mm. Carl Franklin's directing career went back to TV not too many years later. Mm-hmm. Billy Bob Thornton doesn't really show up much anymore. Yeah. So why should I mean, I've been trying to figure this out. This is such a seminal film, but it didn't create a, a huge amount of momentum for everyone in it. Not like it would if it were today. Well, it was a, it was, it was, it was a moment, a momentum for the moment. Uh, you know, and I, I knew a lot of these cats back in this is 91, 91 and, and, you know, and there they were, uh, oddly Billy Bob, who had been acting, you know, I, I think he was on a sitcom yeah. or something like that. And he had, and he had, uh, I think he, what he had, had he done, he had written something else. I can't remember what it was. And, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and then Billy Bob had that career as an actor and a director. What did he do? Sling Blade, he did Sling Blade yeah. and whatever. And then he would be in these big old movies, Armageddon. And I think he pops up in, in Oliver Stone's U-turn. It's this really weird thing that went on with Dan. Angelina Jolie for a while that we've all forgotten about. Um, you remember Billy Bob yeah. and Angelina? That was a whole uh, thing like that. And you know, but you know, you, you have these sort of solid workaday folks. Michael Beach uh, yeah. came out of this movie. Uh, Bill, like you said, Bill Paxton came out of this movie. Cinder was in uh, Spike's Mo Better Blues uh, yeah. a year or two right. out, out of this movie. But and you know, and then it just sort of um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing. Uh, but today. This gritty little movie, which was really considered along the lines of like, um, oh, what's that uh, that film, Straw Dogs? Uh, uh, the, oh the, yeah, yeah, at the, the time. Peck and Peck and Paw. This was this was considered a sort of Peck and Paw moment, right? On, uh, in ninety one, right that's how intense uh, some of the stuff that happens at the top of this. Well, movie is. Carl Franklin is se- is only seventy four, considering that Ridley Scott is eighty six yeah. and directed Napoleon. Uh, somebody should be throwing some great work at Carl Franklin and letting him make some some great movies again because he's one of the best directors of the last 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the last three criterions here, not on, uh, on 4k, but on, on Blu-ray, there is Bo Wiederberg's new Sw- Swedish cinema, which includes the four films, Elvira Madigan, the baby carriage, Raven's end and Odelin 31. Uh, Elvira Madigan, really the, the only one there that I'm particularly fond of and that most people are familiar with, but, uh, you know, Wiederberg or Wiederberg, however you want to pronounce it, uh, certainly was a, uh, one of the, the hallmark Swedish directors in the 1960s alongside, uh, Ingmar Bergman and, uh, a few of the others who, who came out of that school. So, you know, that's a nice box set. Yeah. Wayne Wang's Dim Sum, a little bit of heart. Oh, yeah. Nice little low budget movie that helped uh, along with uh, uh, Wang is missing or, or uh, yeah, uh, uh, not Wang is missing. Uh, uh, Chan is missing. Yeah, Chan is missing. Along, yeah, along yeah. with Chan is missing, launched uh, Wayne, yeah. Wayne Wang's career. Yeah. And uh, Dim Sum's a really sweet film. So, I mean, I, I like I like later Wayne Wang more than the early stuff, but you certainly see where he's coming from with the, a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and The Watermelon Woman by Cheryl Dunye, yeah, um, yeah. which is also on Criterion Channel right now. You can watch this on, on the channel, too. You know, this is a terrific movie from 1996. Uh, what what happened to her since then? Well, she you know, she she has, she, has, she has a little a career in television. You know, she yeah. you, you you look over there, you'll see her, uh, L word and all that kind of stuff. This film here, you know, at that at this particular moment in time, it's funny because I think you and I and Ray, uh, you and I and Ray, our our, our buddy yeah. Ray Green, had a conversation about whether or not she would have been considered a part of the LA Rebellion. Exactly. Uh, at that time, that sort of late 90s. What, what, would that be like right before LA, you, right after you at UCLA? Yeah. LA, Re- LA Rebellion kind of starts just before me. Uh, it's a, it's around 83, 84 that it starts and it kind of sort of ends in some people's minds around 1990, which is when I was there. Hmm. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an imprecise thing, but the actual filmmakers who were, who were part of it, they, they re- basically span late seventies to about mid eighties. Hmm. That's when their their work is there. So it's 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 uh, I would I would include it personally uh, because I think that it, if nothing else, she is a descendant and offspring of that movement and certainly pays homage to it. Yeah, but I get I get why it's a uh, why it's a. Uh, you know, a question mark. So, well, certainly in, in, in terms of the gay and lesbian center, uh, yeah. uh, cinema, uh, it, it'd be foundational there for sure for uh, whether or not. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. But now, yeah, a really, really great movie. And um, it, I'm glad it's getting the criterion collection uh, treatment. That's really great. I am too. And especially because it ties into uh, a performer from the 1930s who was known as the watermelon woman, which yes. is, which is this wonderful kind of a, kind of a, a, the mystery at the middle of this. And it's a, uh, 
it's uh it's really great it's a it's a terrific film it really is it's a it's a it's a really really strong independent entry another from a decade that was just filled with them um where next what should we hit uh let's see how about we dash ourselves over to some of that warner archive material there's a oh, whole yeah. bunch there <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> And then check out some of that. Uh, the Courtship of Eddie's Father. Is that the, is that the, is that the series? The complete series? No, that's oh, the original that the, Vincent Minnelli original movie. Film? Okay, the Vincent Minnelli movie. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, no, no, that's the, uh, so here we go. Let me, let's, uh, let's plow through it. The, uh, the original Vincent Minnelli movie with Glenn, Glenn Ford, Ford and yeah. Shirley Jones. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, really interesting because, you know, the, the idea of broken families and single parents was a thing that was really only be explored in the 1960s. And there were a ton of those TV shows. We talk about it, right? I mean, the sixties had, you know, the, the Brady Bunch combined two of them and there's family affair and oh, uh, the, 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 Griffin the, the, show. And my three sons, sons and, oh and my all that stuff. It was, it was like a, it was like a thing, man, for a while. It there. was. Yeah. yeah. Ron Howard, I had forgotten played Eddie. Yep, and because you always might might think of this, always think of the television show, you know, Bill Bixby, yep. and, uh, but Ron Howard played Eddie. Man, that guy, uh, his career, both as an actor and then you know a writer, director, director, filmmaker, yep. uh, un- unparalleled, I think, in That's this town. Really it's true. just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Yeah. It's fantastic. Really true. Yeah. Uh, King Solomon's Mines with Stuart Granger and Deborah Carr. Uh, kind of, I don't know if this dates all that well, but it's kind of fun in a cheesy way, a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, a little pre uh, on the heels of um, uh, the Indiana Jones movie yeah. uh, doing whatever it did. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, it's sort of pre that, a sort of inspiration for that, this. Uh, we got uh, Ruben Mamoulian and uh, directing, you know, Greta Garbo in one of her oh, very final films as Queen Christina. Um, I would say just watch it because of Garbo. I don't yeah. If you haven't seen Garbo, it's just there is a thing about her. I don't know what it is. It's just she's icy and she's compelling and she's sexy in a way that was not visible in movies at that time. It's just there's something about her. There yeah. really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I'm looking at her next to a picture of Gail Godot right yeah. now. And, you know, obviously both young. I mean, Garbo would have to be young. I think she would act when she's like 36 or something. Uh, okay. People forget how much longer she lived. You would see Greta Garbo roaming around, you know, old Greta Garbo roaming around the streets of New York in the 80s. Yep. Because she owned all this property on the Upper East Side. Uh, and, 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 and she would just be roaming around being Greta Garbo. Uh, and if you didn't know who she was, and you wouldn't if you hadn't seen her since, in, you know, in, in 35 years, yep. you wouldn't have known that that's Greta Garbo. She did that for years and years and years. And there's a great uh, Sidney Lumet movie called Garbo Talks mm. with the... Uh, with, uh, Ron Goldman and uh, and Bancroft and yeah. I dearly love that movie. I yeah. love it and it, people just diss on it. Uh, Dory Sherry, great producer, great old indie producer, uh, yeah. did the boy with the green hair. Oh yes, back in the day. And I just I I this is a such a popular film for so many people, and I just don't get it. I have never gotten it. It's it, <laughs> it, it I just don't. It's like this weird kind of nuclear age. Um, pre-civil rights era attempt to create a metaphor, which for me just doesn't work at all. And uh, <laughs> Joseph Losey directed it, and I'm te- I'm inclined to think the only reason anyone remembers this is because Losey directed it. Yeah, Losey. You got well, you got you got you got you got uh, young young Dean Stockwell. Uh, roaming around this movie, uh, he's, he's the kid, uh, and uh, and and he, so you know, it's 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 if you watch it today, Barbara Hale is in this movie. She's a uh, Perry Mason secretary. You, it is sort of a neat sort of walk down memory lane in that sort of way. But you're right, Dwayne Hickman is in this movie. But you're right, it's an odd little movie. Uh, it's a reference to all kinds of things. So yeah, yeah. What are you do? Hey there, it's Yogi Bear. Uh, really, nothing else to say about this. This was a feature length Yogi Bear movie, and. It overstays its welcome a little bit, but back in the day, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, <laughs> there is a there is now the, the feature length Blu-ray of uh, Hey There Yogi, it's Yogi Bear, um, the uh, the original Women in Prison movie before Ooh, Jonathan caged. Demi started yeah. doing them is Caged. Yeah, uh, Caged was was quite a thing in in its day in 1960, I think this was uh, 1950. 1950. 1950. Yeah, that yeah. John, it's John, it's a John Crumrell film, film, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Eleanor Parker and Agnes Moorhead and uh, Ellen Corby, who was later on the Waltons. Everybody, everybody, you know, nobody had done a women in prison movie. I, I guess I got to give them credit for it. It's not. Ex- I don't think it's that great, but <laughs> you know, it's uh, Dangerous When Wet, a great uh, Esther Williams movie from uh, MGM. It, you know, it's an Esther Williams movie. It's uh, it's. You know, it's a little schmaltzy. It's a little melodramatic. You're really watching it just so that you can see uh, Esther Williams do some uh, Busby Berkeley style water dance with Tom and Jerry. Uh, <laughs> that's really uh, all it is. And that's, you know, there it is. I mean, uh, you know, oh, yeah. it, it, it's <laughs> it, it's just another one of those movies. Uh, Helen of Troy is maybe oh. the only decent movie ever made about the actual Helen of Troy story. It's a little cheesy. It's a little bit uh, sword and sandal ish, but it, it it's directed by Robert Wise, mm. you know, so that's worth something. Right. Absolutely. No, oh, yeah. you Robert Wise, you get me uh, Star Trek, a little Star Trek, a little. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's, uh, you know, so yeah, nice cinescope story of Helen of Troy. No one's done, not done another one since. Uh, Glenn Ford, uh, Broderick Crawford, and Gene Crane in an MGM Western called The Fastest Gun Alive, uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, you know, it's a good, solid Western in Glenn Ford, who is, you know, graduated from my high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, good, good, solid Western guy. I don't know if there's much else you can you can say about it. Uh, Joan Crawford and David Bryan in The Damned Don't Cry. Oh, Joan yeah. Crawford totally holds this down. Uh, better movie than I recall it being originally, but it's still kind of a hard boiled B level noir. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hang, hang on with that. That's uh, the Angel Face, the Otto Priminger's film. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember liking that movie a lot. For one thing, it's Robert Mitchum and, and Gene. Gene Simmons, uh, ridiculously beautiful Gene Simmons, Angel Face. Speaking of, of which, that was a really, really good movie. I love that one a lot. And 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 uh, produced, you know, Preminger directed it for Howard Hughes. Mm-hmm. Howard Hughes was yeah from that uh, from that that Hughes mm-hmm. moment. That is yeah. that is a good film. And and you know anything with Mitchum and uh, Howard Hughes was into Gene Simmons too. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A couple of a couple of Academy Award Best Picture winners here. The original Simran, by, based on the Edna Ferber novel, mm. uh, by many for. considered to be the worst Best Picture winner in history. Mm. I think that's being a little cruel. It's about the 1899 Oklahoma land rush, which is kind of also the subject of Far and Away, the Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, and Cole Kidman. Yeah, yeah. But but you know what? I mean, it won Best Picture because it has a huge epic land rush moment in it. And everybody looked at that and said, "Holy cow! How did they pull that off?" And in, yeah. in the in the early 30s, that was a big deal. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, Simran is is an important historical artifact. A little more important is the Broadway Melody, uh, which was also a Best Picture winner. And I think a very, very deserving one. This was uh, Harry Beaumont's uh, MGM effort, which was one of the first big musicals that really kind of showed what musicals could do and what they could do with sound and uh, kind of trying to open up the capabilities of movies. And they would um, repeat it again and again and again. again, and again <laughs> Broadway again. Melody at 36, Broadway Melody at 37, Broadway Melody at 38. Oh, man, oh, yeah. they made a ton of these. Yeah. They made a ton of these. Yeah. So this is the original Broadway Melody, and it is a nice artifact. It really kind of holds up in some some interesting ways. Yeah. Uh, let's talk for a second about The Old Man in the Sea, the uh, Spencer Tracy adaptation of The Hemingway. Yeah. Um, John Sturges, you know, great widescreen director here. We we know him from things like, uh, you know, The, the Dirty Dozen and... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of other great movies. Um, it, does this capture the book? Because it's been a long time since I read the book. Oh well, you look. It's very presentational uh, and, and and traditional. But but I suppose the book is too. So to the extent that something you know uh, can capture the book in that way, I, I, I would I would say that it does. And, and, you know, looking at this, uh, it's really funny. It's it's such a it's so you you, you can you, you can see uh, the uh, the matte paintings. <laughs> you know, back That's there, true. you can kind of see all that stuff there. So 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 the the sense of uh, of dire uh, in this is, is sort of going. But on the other hand. Uh, um, the, you know, in that presentational sort of form, Spencer Face, uh, Tracy doing that sort of accent thing that he's doing there. I, so, you know, but it's it's a moving movie. I kind of like it. You know, a musical that tends to get overlooked a lot uh, is from the early 40s. Dewberry was a lady. And this is before she was on 
before she had her own TV show, Lucille Lucy, Ball yeah. had a moment where she was on the verge of being a musical movie star. And she is the object of affection for, are you ready for it? Red Skelton and Gene Kelly. Mm-hmm. They're fighting over Lucille Ball. Very, very peculiar little bit of casting there. Tommy Dorsey and Zero Mostel uh, are, are in here for the ride. Uh, Arthur Freed produced it. Uh, Roy Del Ruth directed it. Good, solid MGM mm-hmm. bunch of people. I think it's a fun movie, but it is it is certainly in light of what all of them did later. Red Skelton Show and all of Gene Kelly's other movies and, you know, Singing in the Rain and her, you know. Uh, this Lucy. movie, this movie, this movie, they even call this movie is why, is why Lucy came to be known as a redhead. She wasn't a redhead. That's it. This, yeah, this, that's this right. movie is why, you know, uh, the, the, she's so Technicolor. beautiful and this Technicolor is a redhead. She decided to adopt it as her hair color for yep. the rest of her career. Isn't and that it, wild? Start, it starts with this movie. Uh, and then uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Van Johnson, it, absolutely delightful in The Last Time I Saw Paris, uh, which also features Walter Pidgeon and Donna Reed. Uh, good, solid melodrama, good, solid MGM melodrama from uh, the early 1950s. Very much in the moment. The fashion is so 1950s. Uh, just seeing uh, Donna Reed and Elizabeth Taylor in those great 50s fashions is just terrific. Yeah. But yeah, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit in that Peyton Place mold. Uh, it, it, it captures the moment of the post-war uh, malaise and post-war hope all at the same time. And, it all, and it's set in Paris, for crying out loud. I, you, you just can't go wrong with this. Richard Brooks yeah. keeps everything from getting a little bit too melodramatic. Um, it's based on, a, on an F. Scott Fitzgerald story, but very loosely adapted by uh, Brooks and the Epstein brothers. Um, but I, I think it's perfectly wonderful. I think it's a it's a great film, and it uh, it ages very very well. It, it sort of uh, it suggests the kind of work that he would go on to do. Or he did a lot of writing, Richard Brooks, yeah. with, but he would go on to do. It's kind of like what we were talking about with Freak, and this sort of really realistic sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, as 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 a director, and it would be, they would become more and more realistic. So you get your Alma Gantry, and you're in Cold Blood, and you're. Not, before you know it, you're looking for Mr. Goodbar, which is just like, yeah. you know, absolute realism uh, there. And this sort of walks into that path. Let's hit, let's hit a few of these new movies because there's some good stuff to, to make mention of here. Are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. Oh. I didn't think made enough at the box office because I am. Look, I'm not I was I am not a girl. I have never been a girl. <laughs> I don't know what it means to be a girl. Uh, but uh, I, I hear that this book is like the coming of age book and has been for over a generation. And they have a whole piece of this movie where they, a lot of famous people just go, Oh, I read it when I was eight. I read it when I was 12 and it, it saved me and it did defined life for me. And it's like, you go, Holy cow. What am I, what am I watching here? And it is darn good. Mm. It is darn good. I really, really love this movie. And it's it's weird that I loved it. Um, the, 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 the film is set, you know, it, it's it's set in in, in the era uh, when the yeah. book was was re- the, the book was referencing. Yes, I'll put it like that. That that would be that. Yeah, that's correct. It's set that's in the Judy era. Bloom moment. Judy, Judy Bloom, Bloom '60s '70s moment. Yeah. And I wonder, I wonder if if that has something to do uh, because obviously you know that's her with 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 why it didn't quite connect with a contemporary young lady that's audience. A good point. Uh, you know, um, uh, of the equivalent of, of the, because these girls, you, you're looking at, you know, I'm looking at, I, I enjoyed it too, but then again, I'm from this era. I'm not a girl either, yeah. by the way, but, but I am from this period and all of this uh, rang true to me with respect to well, my big sister and folks like that. I think everybody in this is great. Rachel McAdams, Abby Ryder Fortson and Kathy Bates, three generations right there, mother, grandmother and, and daughter. I think they're, they're, they're all going to be in the running for uh, some kind of awards consideration. And I think this film will come back at awards season and people will rediscover how wonderful it I is. I do hope it is remembered. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, Sisu is an absolutely bonkers Finnish film in English. Uh, it takes place at the end of World War II. The Nazis are, are on the run. They're going into Finland and they're wrecking everything in their path and they make a very big mistake. They find an old guy, a crusty old Finnish guy who's on a horse and he's dragging a bag of gold with him and they decide to try to steal his gold. Oh, no. What they don't realize is this guy is like Mad Max, Dirty Harry <laughs> and 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 Batman uh, rolled into one times ten and he decides it is going to be the end of them and the death of them and he's going to get his gold back and make them pay. And this old guy is just not to be believed. Um, <laughs> this movie is brutal and gory on a it just 
to the nth degree. Uh, how, how, long before, how long before this is this is? What would this be? The, the who, who, who's going to play this guy? In the English oh, the American show? remake. Oh yeah, who's going to oh, play this guy? I'm gosh. sorry. This 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 is a, this is an this is an American remake. Now they'll, they'll probably just nowadays they'll just dub it and put it on Netflix. Yeah. But but uh, but who would who would have? Because it's just really that good. I don't know. I mean, I would have seen, you know, it would have been Clint Eastwood 20 years ago, yeah, but yeah, not Clint yeah. today. Yeah, 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 uh, it yeah. would have been Nick Nolte 10 years ago. 40, uh, Charlie Bronson 40 years ago. Yeah, uh, he's so for sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But man, what a crazy movie. Um, I'm also a big fan of Fool's Paradise. Mm-hmm. Charlie Day wrote, directed, stars in. Nice throwback. It's like being there. You you love this movie too. We had fun with this. Yeah. Um. It's like being there, crossed with Chaplin and Keaton and all the rest of the great silent comics. And uh, it's about a, this hapless homeless guy who doesn't who doesn't utter a word in the whole movie, played by Charlie Day, who literally stumbles into movie stardom. Yeah. And and somehow it just works out for him. This movie is absolutely hilarious. And uh, Ken Jong plays his his agent and manager uh, who also stumbles into discovering him. Great supporting bits from a ton of people. Malkovich and Jason Bateman. Ray Liotta's in here as a crime yeah, like, boss. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. fantastic. Kate Beckinsale is the movie star. He winds up marrying. It's it's just too funny. Really, I mean, if you if you if you like Peter Sellers being there, that sort of thing, it, it really lives right in that space. You can tell that Charlie is a student of all yeah, of that. You're, you're Harold Lloyd, you're your Chaplin, you're all, he's a student yeah. of all of that, and, he's, and he brings it to bear. And it's very, 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 very funny. Yep, it's very it's it is really funny. There are a couple of th- laughs in here that just sent me over the edge. Uh, Book club, the next chapter. Didn't watch it. Didn't see the first one. Have no interest in doing it. But mm. a bunch of uh, actresses who are well past their prime seem to be having fun. Diane Keaton, Jane Fonda, Candace Bergen, Mary Steenburgen, and I have been told that in this uh, in this edition of Book Club, the next chapter, nobody actually reads a book. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm, I'm not going to talk crap about any. Um, uh, I'm, I'll, I guess we'll call them senior yeah. uh, uh, actresses, uh, uh, performers, uh, uh, giving a chance to star in movies. I know that women within the range of these women uh, yeah. love these movies. Uh, they do. I know uh, they they do. love seeing themselves up there on the screen. They love yeah. seeing Don Johnson, who I think. By the way, is too young for all of these broads. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you old cradle robbers, you. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, I, so I so what I say about these movies is, hey, give the ladies what they want. Asteroid City. What do you think of Asteroid City? Look, man, uh, uh, you and I, you and I, you and I have experienced the entirety of Wes Anderson's uh, career. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we started in this business when there was no Wes Anderson, and you know, we came into those movies. And I got to tell you, these films have gotten more and more twee. Uh, uh, now, um, uh, and, and particularly if you think about that first film, Bottle Rocket, right? Yeah. There's nothing twee about that film at all. It's a nasty little Jimmy Conn ga- have gangster movie, you know? And then, so, so now I appreciate what Wes does, but sometimes I feel like he is just, dude, you, you have got yourself in that little egg uh, that is the universe in which yeah. you create this film. This film is a film, is a play set within a film uh, that's on a television show. So we're, we're watching this, this, this play about this place called Asteroid City, which is, uh, which is, you know, it's just this whole thing. And, uh, and you think of it as, it really is at the heart of it, just a lovely little movie about grief. That's all yeah. it is. Jason Schwartzman's lost his wife. He's got but these it, kids. But, he's got a raise. That's all it is. But, but he couldn't just fucking make it. Just make that movie, dude. Just make that movie. He gets lost in the obsession with style, with having everyone have that 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 kind of monotone delivery, with the camera constantly being on a dolly and moving sideways and then moving sideways again, and all of the style. It's like he's doing a parody of his own. Like he's caught up. He's he's trapped by the the expectations that he himself has created. Yeah. And, yeah. and does does it have to look like my parents bleached out uh, uh, chroma comb, chroma comb uh, slides from 1964? Does it have to look like that bleached and kind of faded? Because that's what the look is. And that's mm. not the 1950s to me. It, it's yeah. 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 What, you know, like, and we go th- and, and look. I like some of the, I like a lot of the performances here. Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks happens to join his little, yeah. you know, uh, 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 cast. I, you know, cause he has like a little road crew that he drags around in these movies, Jeffrey Wright, Ned Norton and, and, yeah. and, and whatnot here. You know, he, he, he adds Tom Hanks. He adds Scarlett Johansson. They're good too, but it's just, you know, it's all too, 
to an end it's that, too that again it's just too twee if you just made the movie about this subject with all these people <laughs> yeah. just, without all this tweeness i think i would like that movie well, let's let's hit, hit some 4K here. Uh, there's a ton of great 4K this week. Most of it is is catalog stuff, but it is totally worth it because it all looks great. I am not a huge fan of the movie Ender's Game. Mm. Uh, big fan of the book. I think the movie kind of misses the point a little bit, but it's out in an exclusive 4K steelbook for Best Buy. So you can only get this at Best Buy um, steelbook packaging. But, uh, you know, uh, some people really, really vibe to this. I don't know. Did you like Ender's Game? The movie? No, I'm, not, I'm more of a more more of a the book kind of. Yeah, you know, guys in the actual yeah. the actual kind of film. Uh, look, I, I I will admit that it kind of got me. You know, you're not going to give anything away. It's a ten year old movie, but yeah. <laughs> whatever. But but I was like, oh, you know, okay. But you yeah. know, there you go. Ender's game. Uh, Rio Bravo, the uh, Howard Hawks muscular western with uh, John Wayne and Dean Martin and Ricky Nelson, where all three of them seem to be in a totally different movie. Uh, yeah, John yeah. Wayne's making a John Wayne movie. Dean Martin is wondering, why am I in a John Wayne movie? <laughs> and uh, Ricky Nelson is thinking, I'm so going to make money. I'm going to make a, a great guitar. paycheck. It's about yes. time I got one of these. And I, his name is Colorado in that movie. Uh, which is <laughs> like, just, you're you, well, you know what's fabulous about this movie? Uh, Angie Dickinson. Yes. That's what's fabulous Thank about you. that movie. They said, Thank you. It? Absolutely. Angie, oh my this God. Part of the uh, part of the Warner Brothers uh, 100th anniversary release of a lot of great movies, as is the 40th uh, anniversary or the the what is it now? It's the 50th anniversary of Enter the Dragon mm. uh, on 4K. Uh, still totally holds up. Uh, you know, John Saxon, Jim Kelly. Uh, really, I I think this movie it's it's still great. Sammo mm. Hung is in this as well, very yeah. briefly at the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's it it defines its era, and this is the movie when Bruce Lee kind of stepped forward and became an international icon, be, transcending race. Yeah. And it's the martial arts film that started it for everybody. It started Bolo, it for me. Bolo, it's funny. This and hip hop born the same year. Yep, I think it's for sure. fantastic, fantastic. Well, lots of great extras on this thing. Uh, really, really worth checking out. The Paul Heller, Michael Allen commentary is uh, is superb, but it's the 4K that just sings. The movie has never looked more spectacular. Along um, the new movie front, my gosh, Fast X, it's finally over, mm. or is it? Or is it? Look, man, this movie um, uh, was uh, outlandish. I will give it that. But it was outlandish to the point. Look, there's a moment in this movie, I'm not giving anything away, when a giant flaming nuclear weapon is rolling through the streets. Now, it's not just a nuclear, a flaming nuclear. Yeah. It's a CGI. And, and, and they're using it. And I'm like, okay, look, guys, the physics, the physics of these films have been debated for quite some time. Yeah. Now they just simply decided that there are no physics in, in these films. <laughs> and, so and, they, and, they, so, and then they, and they drag everybody, most everybody, not quite everybody, but they drag everybody back to the movie. And, and I don't know. Is it over? Who knows? I'm not sure it's over. Shout Factory has given us World War Z on 4K, um, and 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 you know uh, I'm wondering will this uh, will there be a sequel as they keep hinting? <coughs> any any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, good question. Um, uh, will there be a, a sequel to World War? There, there certainly is enough material there for yeah. there to be a sequel and considering how many uh walking dead sequels there have been uh you, you know yeah. they, they 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 i can't imagine they can't sort out you know i figure figure out a way to what, do a sequel to this bad it's boy. a it's a great master i am very fond of this film maria maria enos who plays uh um uh, Brad Pitt's wife in the film. I I know the family very well. I've known him for a long time, so I always root for anything that she is in, and I'd love to see her in uh, in a sequel. Yeah. Uh. So you know, uh, get it done, Mark Forster. Get get the band back together. Do a do a sequel. It is also the 70th anniversary of Roman Holiday. Oh, yeah. uh, Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn, and we have a 4K from Paramount with a uh, a voodoo code on it, and uh, I highly recommend it. This is simply the most charming movie in the world. Audrey Hepburn stood, t held her own against Gregory Peck and won an Academy Award mm -hmm. and delivered what I consider to be the archetypal Academy Awards acceptance speech. She went up there and she said, I am so thankful. You've all been so very, very kind. Uh, and she walked off and that was it. 
That was basically <laughs> it. She didn't thank her agent. She didn't thank her co-star. She didn't thank anybody. She just said, you've all been so very, very kind. And she was borderline tears. And then she walked away and everyone loved it. Yeah. That's what everyone's speech should be. You then you get out and the show is over. I love it. I love it. William it is, Wyler, it is, you can't go wrong. It is. It is really. No, you can't go wrong. It's just a wonderful tour of, of the city. And it's a sweet story. And Gregory Peck uh, is wonderful as a scoundrel who is lovable. Yeah. Yeah. A little Dalton Trump. Um, East of Eden, Elia Kazan, John Steinbeck. Uh, I mean, what do we with James Dean? You know, uh, Julie Harris. Where do we where do we what do we say about this movie? Does it uh, does it rock like it did at the time? Well, you know what? The the uh, James Dean being a part of that, the coming of the transition of from that sort of presentational form of acting, which everybody yeah. else in this movie is doing, <laughs> by the way. I mean, yeah. everybody, even the good people, Raymond Massey, Julie Harris is very good. They're all, and Burl, all good, but they're all engaged in that very classic to the moment presentational form of acting. And then you got yeah. this guy, James Dean, uh, who's engaged in this method, no. <laughs> you know, inhabiting this character, e- emoting. Uh, emotions that seem and you can and, and there are moments that Raymond Massey is plainly uncomfortable <laughs> that's really true I've never given that any thought but you're right you can tell in those moments where Massey almost feels like what have I gotten myself yeah, into? like what the hell is going on with this kid <laughs> <laughs> what, you know somebody got to yell cut <laughs> it's losing it <laughs> you know but and, but that 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 is what in, you know, really elevates those moments in this film so that's yeah. the thing I teach this film a lot when, when in, in acting classes that I do uh, with James Dean because, you know, you can put a marker on him, you can put a marker on Brando, you can put a marker, uh, and then you can follow those guys straight through to your uh, Dustin Hoffman's, your um, uh, Popeye, uh, who played Popeye, um, um, you know, all the, all, all, uh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, you know, all those guys. Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just right through. You know, you know what else is a, a landmark in uh, method acting? Mm. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> Not really. Not but really. you know what I love about Matthew Broderick? When, yeah. when, whenever asked, you know, what will you, what will be the thing that you remember? He says, Ferris Bueller. Yes. Uh, yeah. is, is you, 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 you'll be honest, you, 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 Matthew Broderick played Ferris Bueller. Bueller. Uh, and, uh, and you know what? He's okay with that. And I love yeah. that about him, which is why, why I think I like that about this movie that much more. Uh, well, anyway, that's on 4K, a, a uh, steelbook edition. It is this movie holds up. It is more fun to watch than any any movie has a right to be. It's John Hughes at his very best. John Hughes always had two sides to him. He had the you know the kid the, the really inside teenager side, the the uh, the um, uh, Breakfast Club side, and then there's the Home Alone side, which is mm-hmm. you know and vacation, you know the wacky the wacky stuff. And I think it all comes together here. I think this is the consummate John Hughes movie, all sides of his personality. And I love it. And it is on 4K. And, uh, you know, it's got the the John Hughes commentary before he died. And you can't go wrong. It's a steel book. Do yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, Nightbreed is also on 4K. I don't know why. Uh, maybe you can tell me why this movie has any following at all. Well, I always Clive. thought this was just lame. Clive, 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 Craig Sheffield. Yeah, you know, I, I, although uh, David Cronenberg is walking around this movie, and he's a lot of fun walking around this movie, David yeah. Cronenberg. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it's uh, one of those one of those Clive adaptations before 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 Clive just went completely bonkers uh, yeah. uh, in, 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 in off the, the rails. I, look, you got to be into Clive, and, and uh, I I've never been particularly into Clive, uh, but but you know if you are, I suppose that this will work for you in the way that those Clive Barker uh, adaptations work. He interesting that he he directed it, he wrote yeah, it, and wrote it. It's adapted from his own stuff. So what what you got is what he intended. That's so it. you know if you ever wanted to get inside his head about what his, his stuff should look and sound like, this is this is this is one. Uh, and then three final 4Ks from Warner Brothers. There is uh, Justice League War World, a DC Universe movie, which is uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, they're 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 all pretty well written by comics people, and uh, you know this one this one's okay. I mean it's a it's a little bit. Uh, it, it it it's it's the Wonder Woman Batman Superman tandem again, and it goes a little bit far afield for my taste, but I know that fans like it. Mm. There's also Babylon Five: The Road Home, which is an original Babylon Five movie. Mm. I am not a Babylon Five junkie like some people are. Uh, this is this is the the this is uh, an, a a basically an animated thing. So you know it's got some original cast member voices. 
<clears throat> Bruce Boxleitner and, and Peter Jurassic and, and Billy, Billy Mummy and, you know, a few others. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, it feels like stretching the franchise a little far, but again, I'm not a huge fan of it. Mm. And then the first season of The Last of Us, the HBO series, mm. is on 4K, and that'll dovetail us into TV here. How do you feel about The Last of Us? I am very mixed. I, I thought it was pretty was, was pretty strong. I, first of all, I don't know anything about that game. Didn't play the game. Don't know anything about yeah. the game. Um, I, I thought it was pretty strong in terms of its presentation of a, an apocalyptic narrative. I, what I liked about it were those standalone um and, and none of them are standalone, but but uh, because it's sort of all out of sequence. So that that sequence with uh, Nick Offerman and, and and Mary Bartlett, you know, yeah, uh, th- th- that I thought was just absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and I and I loved it when it was doing that. The sort of walk through narrative, you know, it, you, I, I'm sorry, with all of these Walking Dead, you know, pick pick wh- whichever one you want to pick. Uh, they eventually become repetitive. Yeah. Because because there's really only one thing that can happen here. We we have our heroes. Our heroes will be under threat of being overtaken by you know whatever it is you can overtake. Yeah. Them. I think it's mushrooms or some shit in this. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, and and, and uh, or vampire, whatever it is. And then, you know, and then 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 they have to survive that threat. And whoever is lost is lost. And then we do it again. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I can only take one season of the of The Walking Dead doing that. I'm not sure why I would want a, a, another whole bunch of seasons of this doing that. Yeah. So we shall see what happens. Let's uh, let's wrap things out with just a little bit of TV here. The the Venture Brothers have a uh, a standalone Blu-ray release of Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, of all the titles you could go with, that's the one you went with. Okay, fair enough. Um, anyway, the uh, and this goes along with the Venture Brothers, the complete series uh, on uh, on DVD. Mm. I just don't know. Um, never was how a, I feel never about was, the Venture never, Brothers. Never was never was a Venture Brothers guy. Never was. Yeah, never it's. Was Fan, fans only for that one. Uh, Tim, you've mentioned Fear the Walking Dead a couple of times. Yeah. Seasons one through seven. Uh, on a box set here, uh, DVD, not not Blu-ray. Um, people should buy it. Not. What do you think? Well, the the one thing I will say about Fear the Walking Dead, and I'm you know, and, I, and again, I I was a Walking Dead guy, but Fear yeah. the Walking Dead does in fact uh, have at the center of it uh, some really 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 good performances and some and some excellent actors. So that's Isn't what it? I like about Fear the. Excuse me, Cliff Curtis is in there. You got you got Coleman Domingo walking around there. You got Lenny James walking around there. So that's what I kind of like. Jenna Elfman is even walking around there. She's good at it, by the way. Um, but that's what I like about this run. Uh, some great performances How does it compare from to The Walking Dead. No, How does it compare to The Walking Dead? No, 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 no. It doesn't even come close because you can't. You, 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 we, 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 we. We do not have the opportunity to build up that character allegiance thing that's going on because what they're doing in this. Is, is 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 engaging you and then i don't want to ruin it for anybody but nobody makes it very long yeah <laughs> you know, no, no, nobody's making it to the end in, in this but that's that's because that's the way this is constructed uh we're gonna bring you in and we're gonna kill them off quick that's what's going on and then we got a couple of a couple of animated series uh that could be not be more different the complete 2003 tv series and television movie of teenage mutant ninja turtles mm. this is the original series that basically started everything and it's perfectly fine <coughs> yeah i it's perfectly fine i uh it's a certain kind of animation. I think it feels fresh in ways that the 27 other series that they have done since have not. <laughs> um, the voice casting makes sense. So, you know, it's worth for, for nostalgia buffs. That's a good one to hang on to. And South Park uh, seasons 21 through 25 in a box set. Uh, they're doing this now, apparently, five seasons at a time. Mm. I think it kind of makes sense. Um you know, you can, it's just, this thing's been on the air for two decades. Nobody's going to know where to find the episode that they like. So, you know, might as well buy five seasons at a time and, and, you know, throw it on, let it play out, put it on during parties, put it on during the day, <laughs> just, just enjoy the jokes as they roll by. Um, it's a, it's a smorgasbord of, of, uh, pop culture madness and they somehow keep it going. Lots of commentaries, lots of commentaries and fun stuff. 
All right. Uh, we'll save the rest of the stuff for the next time. Uh, All strikes, right, are still, strikes are still going on. I mm. think I'm probably going to go join. Uh, I think there were talks. Mine. What uh, as of as of this taping, there were yeah. talks. Was that today or yesterday? I guess that, that was yesterday. yesterday but it's, it, it, who cares? I mean, it's not. It's not going to go anywhere. They're going to put it out next week. I mean, by the time this show is up, they'll be putting it out to the membership, and the membership will say no, and the strike will continue. Mm. Mm. What well, do we have any word on? I know an offer was made. Uh, they they have, have not word? talked since May, and they've spent three months putting together um, uh, what they. I, I, this is my prediction. They put together three months worth of uh, divide and conquer proposals. Mm. So they're trying to figure out what can we offer certain m- smaller constituencies of the Writers Guild that will peel them off so that the guild will not be on strike anymore. They're going to try to peel out so that, you know, showrunners will give them a little something, and then these writers will give them a little something, and these writers will give them a little something, and that way everybody will feel like they're getting something, but they'll cave on the AI. They will cave on the pension fund and the residual and the data stuff. They're mm-hmm. trying to to divide and conquer. That's my prediction. I don't think it's going to work. Mm-hmm. All right, interesting. We, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll talk about it next time. Um, All right. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Damn, wow. Awesome. All right, Tim, have a good week. We'll see everybody else next time. Okay, brother.